Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us for another edition of the Great Canadian Debates. This will be the last debate we have for this season, which I think has uh, been an excellent one so far. Uh, my name is David Watson. I'm with the McDonald laurie Institute. Um, <clears throat> I'd have to admit I'm a little nervous up here today. Uh, if you told me back uh, when I was in journalism school at Ryerson University that I'd be sharing the stage with John Hondrick and Andrew Coyne, I would have been just gobsmacked and delighted. Um, of course, when you told me why I would be here, I would have marched down the hall <clears throat> uh, and transferred into criminology or uh, engineering, fashion design, something uh, with better prospects than a journalism degree. Uh, but of course, like everyone here, and particularly our two debaters, uh, I feel very strongly that free and robust news media uh, have never been more vital to our democracy. I think we can also agree that the fate of journalism in Canada is one of the more pressing issues we face. Uh, and it seems quite certain there will always be an overwhelming demand for high quality news and opinion. Uh, and so while there, <coughs> pardon me, so while there continue to be pain as the media adapt uh, from the old models, there is a future for journalism. Uh, what the future looks like and how we get there uh, is where we can certainly differ, uh, but perhaps we'll at least have a clearer picture of what the possibilities are after tonight. Um, <coughs> I couldn't be, uh, be more pleased that John and Andrew have agreed to participate in this debate. I can't think of two more respected newspaper men in this country, uh, although a certain um, present company in attendance would certainly be in that conversation as well. Uh, now I'd like to turn things over to our moderator, Peter Milliken. Uh, Peter, as many of you know, is Canada's longest serving speaker of the House of Commons. Uh, so we're sure they'll uh, use his, <coughs> pardon me, I'll bring his legendary impartial uh, judgment to bear in keeping our debaters on time and on topic. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, David, for your kind introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to this debate. Um, I um, am supposed to do certain things first, uh, and that is first uh, to uh, uh, extend um, uh, my welcome to all of you, but also to tell you about how the debate will proceed. Um, first, uh, there will be a uh, the motion put, which is that the government must act to save journalism in Canada. It's a short and easy one. Um, and then each of the speakers will have 20 minutes in which they can make a, a maximum of 20 minutes in which they can uh, indicate their views on this issue. Uh, we'll be starting with John Hondrick, who's speaking in favor of the motion, and then Andrew Coyne will have 20 minutes to respond to that. Uh, after each of those speeches, we will have five minutes each for uh, rebuttals. And then we'll open the uh, floor to questions. Um, we will have uh, basically uh, an arrangement where we will have three questions asked in a row, one minute maximum each. Uh, and there are microphones here that you see you can go to. And we'll have three questions and then each of the uh, debaters will have three minutes to respond to those three questions. Um, and then we'll have three more, then response. And then we can do three more, and that'll be that, and response, and that'll be that. When that finishes, each of the debaters will have five minutes for their concluding remarks, and um, that will be the end of the debate. However, we also seek the opinion of you as people here. We'll ask a question at the beginning, and I will do that in a second, um, uh, asking whether you agree or disagree with the motion, and then we'll ask the question and have another vote after the debate is over to see if it has changed your minds. So that's the uh, proposal tonight. Um, what I wanted to do also was, of course, introduce our, our two speakers, um, and I've got brief bios here that I will fill you in with. Um, John Hondrick, who is speaking in favor of the motion, was born in Toronto and attended the University of Toronto uh, and the U University of Toronto Law School. In 1973, he was called to the Bar of Ontario. After a long career as a newspaper journalist that began with the Ottawa Citizen and included six years as editor of the Toronto Star, in 1994, Mr. Hondrick was appointed publisher of the Star, a position he held for almost 10 years. He also served as chairman of Canadian Press Canadian Director of the World Association of Newspapers and a director on the boards of the Canadian Newspaper Association, 
the Audit Bureau of Circulations and Workopolis.com, as well as serving on the boards of numerous charitable organizations. In May 2009, he was appointed chair of the board of Torstar Corporation. Andrew Coyne, who is... Keep this brief. <laughs> was that too long? No. Oh, oh. This well, is very daunting. yours isn't longer. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> Not, what, uh, not unless it takes me longer to read it. But um, <laughs> Andrew Coyne, one of Canada's best known public commentators, is a national affairs columnist for Post Media News. Raised in Winnipeg, Mr. Coyne is a graduate of the University of Toronto and the London School of Economics. He has written previously for Maclean's Magazine, the National Post, and the Globe and Mail, contributing as, uh, contributing as well to a wide range of other publications in Canada and abroad, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, National Review, Saturday Night, and The Walrus. The winner of two National Newspapers Awards and the Hyman Solomon Award for Excellence in Public Policy Journalism, he is also a weekly panelist on CBC's The National. So we're delighted to have two wonderful debaters tonight. And uh, I will now put the question to you for a vote. Do you agree or disagree with the, the motion, the proposal, the government must act to save journalism in Canada? All those wanting to vote yes for this motion, will you please raise your hand? Fair number. All those opposed who say nay. Ah, many more. Okay. <laughs> I did? No, no. I oh, 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 oh. Mr. Speaker, I would never impugn you. Stacking isn't something I'm good at. Anyway, all right. So we will now proceed with the debate. I call on Mr. Hondrick to uh, make his opening statement on this subject. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for that kind introduction. Uh, my great pleasure to be here this evening. Andrew, great to be able to debate with you. And I have to say, here I am, standing in front of you, arguing, gobsmacked was an excellent word, arguing for a proposition that I would never have dreamed even remotely tolerable. <laughs> and of all places, in the War Museum. Yet. <laughs> I want you to know I'm here, and I'm here with conviction to argue the proposition before us. My argument will unfold as follows. First, what is the history of government support for media in our country? Two, why has the situation changed so dramatically for newspapers in Canada? And three, why do newspapers deserve support at this point. First, I think it is absolutely essential to debunk the notion that somehow government assistance to media, and more particularly newspapers, is somehow radical or brand new. Indeed, such assistance to media, either direct or indirect, has been around this country for decades. In fact, Virtually all forms of expression in Canada have received some form of government support. Let me be more specific. The first and most obvious example is the Canadian Periodical Fund. That predates Confederation. And that fund provides that direct financial assistance be given to print magazines and non-daily newspapers. And I quote here the purpose, to continue to provide Canadian readers with quality content, end of quote. Indeed, the top recipient of that fund, almost two million a year, is Maclean's Magazine, for which, parenthetically, <laughs> They're on, Andrew, they're on. <laughs> My esteemed colleague once worked for Maclean's magazine, and I think it's fair to say that his pen was never dulled in that capacity. <laughs> Secondly, in Ontario, 
There is no HST on newspaper sales because of what the government decided was the special place for newspapers in our society. Third, for years, Ottawa has paid a TV and film tax credit. And again, I quote, to encourage Canadian programming. And that credit has been in place for years. Fourth, in Ontario, there has been a digital media tax credit for those working on digital publishing. Fifth, in its last budget, the Quebec government committed $36 million in direct government assistance to Quebec newspapers over a three-year period. Sixth, this one I like, eight years ago, then Conservative Finance Minister Jim Flaherty provided pension relief for Canada's national press agency, the Canadian Press. And whenever I saw Minister Flaherty, he was proud that CP continued to operate because of the assistance the government gave. I might add, sadly, his current counterpart shares little of the same spirit. <laughs> Seventh, we all remember how the CRTC regulation years ago mandated radio stations must play Canadian songs. Remember how much we heard Anne Murray. <laughs> and that eventually led to the creation of a vibrant Canadian recording industry. Finally, and eighth, we have, of course, Ottawa's $1.1 billion funding of the CBC, which is intended to, and again I quote, contribute to national consciousness and identity. I want you to know I support the overall CBC and its mandate. And parenthetically, I might add again, my esteemed colleague <laughs> is a regular, and I might say able commentator on the panel, and I wouldn't say that government support in any way has dulled his anti-government spirit. <laughs> That's the story in Canada. What about overseas? And again, the examples are as many as they are diverse. In the United Kingdom, Germany, Italy, France, and Finland, all newspapers are exempt from the VAT, or the sales tax. In France and Italy, there are direct subsidies to newspapers. In France, it comes in the form of circulation support. In Italy, it is actually direct payments. Indeed, I can tell you that Corriere Canadesi, which was the Italian language newspaper in Toronto, used to receive an annual multi-million dollar payment direct from the Italian government. All those countries as well subsidize and pay for public broadcasting networks of which you know, like the BBC. Uh, in France, the government, as part of its mandate, contributes directly to France's equivalent of Canadian press. It's called Agence Presse Française. In the United Kingdom, the British government directly has assisted BBC overseas. So you put it all together, you look at all those examples, it's rather difficult to say that the concept of government system is far-fetched, or for that matter, even novel. So why now in Canada? As I said at the outset, I never saw myself making this argument. I have always preferred, like Andrew, for newspapers to operate profitably and thus be on any need for assistance and the whiff of bias that necessarily accompanies it. Yet, to be blunt, the business model for newspapers in Canada is badly broken. The advent of the internet, Facebook and Google has completely changed the landscape, as it has for newspapers around the globe. The evidence of this decline has been obvious to everyone for the past decade. Reporters have been laid off in droves across the country. Editorial budgets have been slashed, particularly in smaller towns where we have many cases where city councils and board of educations simply go uncovered. Today, I was told, a government official, seven 
of Canada's 10 legislative bodies have no regular press coverage. Just think, seven of the 10 have no regular press coverage. Ryerson professor April Lindgren is actually keeping tabs on these closures across the country. They lead to, they lead to hundreds of papers that have shut down, creating what I call non-news deserts in small town Canada. The Public Policy Forum did a recent report on the state of the industry and concluded, and again I quote, the news media's march to the precipice appears to be picking up speed. To give you an example of the advertising ch challenge, think of those programmatic ads you see as you're reading stories online. Google and Facebook own 85% of all those ads. The number of places to advertise on the internet now is infinite. And as a result, newspaper revenue has been declining at double-digit rates. I can well remember the days when we ran 40 to 50 pages, full pages, classified advertising. Today, those ads are all on Kijiji. And our biggest classified category? Births and deaths. As business editor of The Star, I can remember when we ran 30 pages of career advertising completely gone. And I can tell you, those ads put together paid for a lot of reporters. At the Star, our total editorial staff has decreased from a high of 475 to about 175 today. And that story, I can tell you, is repeated across the country, I might add, in even more draconian numbers. And nor do I think it's fair to say that newspapers have just stood idly by. Various digital innovations, paywalls, in our case, the Globe and the Star created Workopolis. We also created a tablet-specific initiative and spent millions. We've tried to invest and go, so far, without any great success. And everyone across the globe is monitoring each other to see if the key to digital success can be found. So, why should government step in? Are we just a failing industry? I expect you might hear a little about that. At the outset, I want to emphasize there is no God-given principle that says newspapers must be helped. Our economic history is replete with stories of industries whose time has come and gone. Horse-drawn buggies, video stores, fighter jets. <laughs> so why should Canadians want their hard-earned tax dollars going to help newspapers? The argument must be both strong and compelling. And judging by the vote here tonight, very compelling. <laughs> but in my view, it is. At this point in our history, I argue, newspapers play a critical and fundamental role in the health of our democracy. To me, the functioning of a healthy democracy is predicated on a well-informed populace. And the quality of public debate, if not the very quality of life, is a direct function of the quality of media that serve it. If the media don't do the hard-hitting, groundbreaking investigations, along with the bread and butter coverage of our basic civic institutions, we all suffer. And in my view, it is newspapers that have always played a unique role in this informing process. Indeed, Look at the winners of the Michener Prize in Public Interest Journalism since the turn of the century. The highest prize in Canadian journalism open to all media. Twelve of the 16 winners have been newspapers. The other four, the government subsidized CBC. <laughs> Why? Because it is still newspapers where most reporters are employed 
and through investigative journalism, pointed commentaries, crusades, biting editorials, good commentary, newspapers have most often, and still do, set the agenda for public discussion. Newspapers provide, when well run, the means for a populace to examine itself, a channel to ferret out lies, abuse, and corruption, and a vehicle to give voice to those whose voices are not often heard. Now, I'd be the last one to deny the impact of the electronic media. And nor is there any set rule that says newspapers must play this role. But for decades, they have. And they continue. And I even like to say to people, look south of the border today as we watch the debate unfold. It is the legacy newspaper media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, that are leading the way. There is a similar history in Canada, and at the risk of immodesty, I think I will cite three examples of Toronto Star work, which might buttress my case. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, the Star, using all the arrest records in Toronto, exposed the practice of racial profiling within Toronto's police force. The series rocked the city. Police took us all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. We won at every level. For this series alone, it took more than $1 million, more than three years' work, countless court challenges, and a determination that only comes from a media institution flush with resources and an iron will. Six years ago, a second example, we started uncovering what I might call the peccadillos of our then mayor, Rob Ford. <laughs> As story after story ran, the Ford brothers encouraged a total boycott of the star from both advertisers and subscribers. I can tell you we lost hundreds of thousands of dollars as a result, but we were not deterred. What if that work had not been done? I'd like to remind people that in the last municipal election, our current mayor, John Tory, beat Rob's brother Doug by a scant three percentage point. The third example covers the same time and shows the power of one reporter, and it involves the former mayor of Brampton, which is Canada's 10th largest city. In a case, it was this one reporter, his name is San Gruel, who continued to write story after story of financial mismanagement, dubious connections. I can tell you in that process, that reporter was threatened. He had coffee thrown in his face, but he knew the paper and I might add a former premier, were fully behind him. At the last election, the voters in Brampton made up their minds, and that former mayor finished a very distant third. So I say, what would have happened if these stories hadn't run, this work hadn't been done? And what about those countless communities where there is no longer any coverage? Think of those seven provincial legislatures. Make no mistake, the decline in coverage across the country has already had a profound impact on the quality of media in Canada and consequently, I would argue, on the quality of our debate. There are some who rhapsodize on the proliferation of reporters, commentators, and bloggers present on the web. Some call this democratization of information, allowing one and all to participate in shaping our national commentary. I don't share that view. Why? Because these same bloggers and instant communicators rarely choose to do the deep, in-depth investigation. Rather, their bywords too often are speed, speed and instant reaction. Is Facebook the answer? All the surveys show more and more, particularly millennials, are getting their news from Facebook. Do I want my country's national commentator 
left to Mark Zuckerberg? I think not. What about Twitter? Again, huge news source. Somehow, 140 characters to do an inquiry into racial profiling just simply doesn't do it. Instagram, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> Which brings us back to newspapers and the critical role they play today. Is it possible other models will emerge to replace newspapers and the kind of journalism I'm talking about? Could they emerge? And my answer is yes, they could, but they haven't yet. My generation has been scratching its collective head for years to come up with the answer. So far, we've failed, which brings us right back to the resolution before us. In my view, the evidence is overwhelming that newspapers play a critical role in our democracy. And that role is under severe stress. There is an overwhelming public good at play here, which is why I am fully in support of tonight's motion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hondrick. Uh, we now have our second presentation on the nay side. Mr. Coyne, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you everyone for being here. I must say it's both an honor and quite daunting to be sitting here on the stage with uh, one of the legends of Canadian journalism, but I'll do my best to hold up uh, my side of things. Uh, the problems facing the news industry are well known uh, and certainly well reported. The internet brought the marginal cost of news distribution down to near zero, allowing literally thousands of competitors to emerge from well-funded startups to indi individual bloggers. At the same time, it has merged what were previously separate industries, print, radio, television, and online, making close competitors of news outlets that might previously not have regarded each other as such. Worse, the advertisers on which newspapers and other media have historically relied have deserted them for eBay and Kijiji, Facebook, and Google. Online advertising revenues are climbing, but not nearly, yet, not nearly enough yet to make up the loss. It's an unnerving, disorienting time to be in the business. At the National Post, we like to say we work in the nonprofit sector. <laughs> and increasingly, the industry has persuaded itself that its present condition is a threat not to the profits of its owners or the salaries of its employees, but to democracy itself. Hence the plaintive cries for government assistance, and hence tonight's debate. John is amused that I have so consistently argued against my self-interest in this matter. I must say I'm equally amused that he would so unashamedly argue in favor of his self-interest. <laughs> but however indispensable I and my remaining colleagues believe ourselves to be, there is one group that has proved rather less easily persuaded of this, and that would be everybody else. As arguments for subsidy go, the unwillingness of people to buy your product is not one of the more persuasive. The reality is this is not a case of market failure, but of industry failure. The market is accurately reflecting a harsh but inescapable truth. People do not value the thing we are selling at a price sufficient to cover its costs. And what is more, we are ill-placed to tell them they are wrong. People in our industry talk about our present dilemma as if it were something that just happened to us, like the weather or a traffic jam. Oh, well, you know, it's the internet, isn't it? It's social media, it's Google. It's completely disrupted our business model. I'm inclined to think people in other industries hear this and say, oh, really? So you say the internet killed your business model. Join the club. Everybody's business has been disrupted by the internet. Other industries have been gutted. Hundreds and thousands of jobs have been lost in other sectors. Only not everybody has quite the same platform with which to advertise their woes. We can talk all we want about the role of social media, of Google or whatnot, but in the end it comes down to whether or not we offer a compelling enough product to attract paying customers. And if we are honest with ourselves, we will concede that too often we have not. 
We ignored the web for far too long, and then we got wise, we put out lousy web pages. Most of them seem to have been designed with no other purpose but to deter anyone from reading them. <laughs> Cluttered with ads and autoplay videos and links to other sites. When the iPad came along, we put out lousy iPad apps, made not for readers, but it seems for bored children. We stood and watched as Kijiji and eBay took our classified business, and rather than adjust to the new reality, when it became clear that Facebook and Google were taking the rest, for the simple reason that they provided a better service to advertisers, we complained to government. And of course, we gave away all of our content for free, an error we have had ample time to repent. Mind you, there's nothing particularly new in this. We've never charged the reader, at least in North America, Europe's a little different, more than a fraction of our costs, relying instead on advertising revenues to foot the bill. And not coincidentally, most newspapers have never been much good. We generally substituted quantity for quality, filling the paper with much more copy than would ever be read on the theory that as long as readers were lingering long enough over the page to look at the ads, it didn't much matter whether they looked at everything, anything else. Much of what we put out was lazily written, thinly researched, and worst of all, dull. The ratio of cheap sentiment and pack following to the fearless investigative reporting that is supposedly our raison d'etre is not flattering to our case. But when the newspaper, decades ago, was one of the very few games in town, when the choices available were maybe one or two newspapers, a couple of television stations, and whatever competition radio provided, we didn't have to be that good, frankly. The difference is we could get away with it then, we can't now. Absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing is preventing readers from paying for what we produce, if they so chose. They are simply choosing not to do so. If there were something preventing them from paying, if it were impossible for some reason to charge them for our services, there might be more of a case for subsidy. There's a name, there's a name for goods and services for which it is impossible to restrict the benefits to those who pay or to exclude from benefiting, benefiting those who do not pay. They're called public goods. National defense is the classic example. I get the benefit of being defended even if I don't pay as long as you do. As such, public goods have to be paid for with taxes. Otherwise, chiselers like me would free ride on upstanding, upstanding people like you. And if there were enough of us chiselers, no one would pay for defense. That's the public good case for subsidy, not to force people to pay for things they don't want, but to force them to pay for things they do. Is news a public good? People have tried to make that claim, which I'll get to in a second. But first let me note that the burden of proof is very much on them. However strongly I might believe that people who never read the National Post, never think about the National Post, except in those moments when they despise it and wish it were dead, nevertheless got some sort of benefit from it and therefore should be forced to pay for it, well, I'm likely to have a hard time persuading them of that fact. Even if some putative claim might be made out, moreover, it runs into another problem. Lots of other claims for public funds can be made and are on exactly the same grounds, and resources are inescapably finite. The public money spent keeping me and John Hondrick and Paul Godfrey in our cushy overpaid jobs and rescuing us from our mistakes is money that will not be spent on literacy programs or Aboriginal communities or health care. One way to argue that news is a public good is to suggest that the rewards for one newspaper's reporting cannot be restricted, restricted to that paper. Newspaper A publishes a scoop, the result of months of investigative work, and immediately its competitors rush to publish the same story, essentially negating any competitive advantage it might have gained, so nobody does any reporting. It's a persuasive sounding story, it just doesn't conform to actual observation. The more typical responses when a competitor has a big scoop are to A, ignore it altogether, B, match it but bury it on page 39, or C, actively discredit it. We do so because in fact scoops do pay. The paper that consistently breaks big stories reaps the gain of being a newsy paper, the paper that gets talked about, the paper people want to read. Sometimes the comparison is made between news and basic research, the kind that private businesses can't reap the gain from because there's no immediate commercial application. But there's a fundamental difference between the two. Science is contentious enough, 
but there's at least some consensus on what it is scientists do. The scientific method, the peer review, the, the replicability of results, and so on. In journalism, by contrast, everything is contested ground. What's a news organization? Who's a journalist? What's news? How should it be covered? What's true, what's false, to say nothing about differences of political opinion? Everything is contested ground. And if public funds are to be distributed, that means that someone, somewhere, has to start deciding these questions. They have to decide who to give money to and on what criteria. This brings the government inevitably into areas in which it has no business intruding. Which brings me to my second broad point. Not just the public subsidy of the news industry is unnecessary, because we are mostly the authors of our own misfortune and because news is not a public good, but that it, but that it is and would be harmful. It might have been one thing when the media universe was confined to a handful of newspapers or three or four television networks or a few dozen radio stations, but that world is gone. The gates have been torn down. The original case for subsidy, well, everybody's a journalist now, it's actually the case against it. The business of journalism cannot now be meaningfully defined without reference to hundreds, indeed thousands, of online outlets from news and comment sites employing hundreds to individual bloggers. You can't possibly subsidize all of them. But you can't have the government picking and choosing either. The minute you exclude someone in favor of someone else, you involve the government in deciding who should succeed and who should fail, and inevitably which points of view should. The issue here isn't necessarily that this power would be abused in partisan terms, that those who supported the government would be favored over those who opposed it. It's that any criterion would be applied. So we would give subsidies maybe to proper newspapers, that is to say the legacy media, but not to scrappy little online startups that are the future of the industry? Or would it be on the basis of size? Would we give it to the Toronto Star but not BuzzFeed? Would we give it to BuzzFeed but not Canada Land? Or let's really get into it. Let's get down to brass tacks, what I call the Ezra test. <laughs> Ezra Levant, that is, and his notorious website, The Rebel. Inflammatory, inaccurate, prejudicial, and I'm speaking mildly. <laughs> many would agree it is peddling propaganda, not journalism. And yet many others would insist with equal conviction it's the only place to find real news that everyone else in the mainstream media is peddling propaganda. I'm going to assume that most of the people in this room are in the first camp. The question is, to, is whether we are entitled to impose our tastes on those who think otherwise. Because unless you're prepared to subsidize Ezra along with everybody else, Ezra and others even worse, you're still in giving the government the power to decide who's a journalist, or at least who's an acceptable journalist. Of course, it's inconceivable, you would say, and I would agree, it's inconceivable that the government would subsidize his kind of hateful bile but it's equally inconceivable that the government would not do so while subsidizing others with different viewpoints. In sum, if the government can't subsidize anyone, everyone, it shouldn't subsidize anyone. But then the real threat, I suppose, would not be state selection, but self-selection. I worry less about the impact of subsidy on those who did not receive it as on, as on those who did, how it would change us, the things we thought to cover, the attitudes we brought, it, we brought to it. To put the matter in personal terms, how could I or anyone ever attack the idea of bailing out Bombardier or subsidizing the auto sector if our own industry had just been the recipient of the same? Of course, over time, it wouldn't occur to us. The minute we started taking the public dime, we would do as every other recipient does. We would come to feel entitled to it. We would forget that anyone had ever written a word without forcing others to pay for it. Maybe some would resist taking the money for a while, but they'd be a competitive disadvantage relative to those who did. Over time, this benevolence would extend outward to other industries. Overt political influence would not be the danger so much as a general inclination to look with favor on the state and on state sponsorship as the natural order of things. We would see our own beneficiary relationship with the state not as confirmation of our failure to offer readers a product worth the money we were asking of them, but as evidence of our superior worth. And we would come to regard ourselves not as humble hacks trying to earn a few minutes of the reader's time, the only basis of good writing, but as a public service with a sacred duty to bore the pants off them. 
I am, of course, aware that government support is not unknown in the Canadian media, from subsidies to the magazine industry, to the CBC's parliamentary grant, to the restrictions on foreign ownership, and I saw in this list we were including a CanCon in songs as being equivalent to subsidizing newspapers. I hardly think this makes the argument for more of it, for that, 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 that somehow what is now the exception should be the universal rule, that basically the CBC should be the model for the entire Canadian newspaper industry. The chief effect of restrictions on foreign ownership has been to make the Canadian media more concentrated and yet more vulnerable because thinly capitalized than it would otherwise have been. The CBC's subsidy, now that it is a publisher as well as a broadcaster, has enabled it to poach staff and advertising revenues from private publishers to their increasing dismay. I think, I, get, I dare say John might be even one of them. And the Canadian magazine industry, as an argument in favor of subsidy, the Canadian magazine, an industry so dedicated to excellence that it hands out literally hundreds of awards for it every year. The premise, in short, that subsidy equals quality journalism is a flawed one. You are either writing to be read or you are wasting your time. And nothing focuses the mind more on the reader than the necessity of separating him or her from their hard-earned money. It's what keeps us from becoming precious and self-involved. Well, it's what keeps us from becoming even more precious and self-involved. <laughs> Indeed, I regard the words quality journalism with some suspicion, as I do responsible or accountable journalism. Journals, we heard a, a long essay on the high-minded pursuits of, of Canadian journalism. Journalism, in my view, at its best, is generally disreputable. It's often been partisan, and sometimes it's been wrong. The case for journalism is not that it is responsible, civic-minded, or devoted to the public good. It can be but it does not depend on being so. The case for journalism is the case for clash, that out of the jumble of petty vendettas, axe grinding, spin, and self-promotion that make up the news, that daily collision between the interests and obsessions of its readers and the egos and ambitions of its writers, something close to an accurate portrait of the times emerges. I have no idea whether the newspaper industry will survive, but I know in my bones what would kill it forever. If we must go, let us at least go with a little dignity and not as mewling supplicants for government grants. <laughs> but then, I don't really think we're going anywhere. And this is my final point. The news of our death is, as they say, greatly exaggerated. Arguments for subsidy that ask us, as in the words of that recent public policy forum report, Shattered Mirror, to, quote, imagine a world with no news, or that suggest the industry is about to disappear and democracy with it, are menacing you, in H.L. Mencken's phrase, with hobgoblins. What's really going on is not the collapse of the industry so much as its transformation. From print to digital, yes, but more importantly, from advertising finance to reader finance. I don't say it will be easy. To persuade people to pay for something they're used to getting for free or nearly free is always tough. But the very worst way to encourage the industry to make that difficult transition is to bail it out with public cash. I should say my optimism on this point is hardly starry-eyed. The cold hard fact is there has only ever been a minority of people who read anything. And there's only ever been a minority of them who read anything worth reading. <laughs> but that minority of a minority who want to be well informed and who value good journalism has always existed and will always exist. We just have to get them to pay for it. And to get them to pay for it, we'll have to make it worth their money. That is the great migration the industry is on. Not all or even most of the established players will survive the trek, but the ones who do may find the effort quite worthwhile. Already we can see evidence, evidence of it starting to pay off at the top end. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal all report soaring subscription numbers even as they tighten their paywalls. That won't be the only business models. Others, though it's fishing for clicks at the bottom of the market, will survive on advertising as before. 
It's the mid-market papers who may have the toughest time of it. We don't have to completely guess at this. Much the same sorting has already happened in television. In some ways, TV has never been worse, all those reality shows and talent competitions, and in some ways it has never been better. As it has often been remarked with shows like The Sopranos and The Wire, TV is in something of a golden age, and it's no accident where you see each. The crap is on free TV, the traditional advertising finance networks, and the good stuff is on pay, HBO, AMC, Netflix, and the rest. A paying audience is a demanding audience, and a discerning one. It took a while to get people used to paying for TV. It will take a while to get people used to paying for news. But people will, I'm convinced, pay for quality. The only question is whether we will provide them with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Coyne. So we've had uh, two uh, fine presentations. We'll now have a rebuttal. So we'll start, Mr. Hondrick. Uh, you have uh, five minutes to respond to the remarks of our colleague here. So uh, I want to start with some facts about the industry. I think it's always good to return to the facts. <laughs> One of the opening statements from my esteemed colleague is that people don't value what they're reading. They don't value what they're seeing from newspapers. It's very interesting. If you get your news today, a newspaper, in paper form, you're probably paying more than you've ever paid before. The circulation price to get the paper is higher than it's ever been. We know it's only the boomer generation that's reading them. What we did as an industry, and on this one I'm in agreement, we made the mistake of putting all the content online for free. We created a paradigm where if we provide the information in print, you pay for it at your home if you get it online. And the competitors that are out there now, I can tell you the number of people who are reading Toronto Star content is higher than it's ever been. People do value. The work that was done for, for public policy showed that when it comes to issues of public concern, people turn to the legacy media, the newspapers, to find out what's going on. But they get it for free. And they can f get it anywhere. In Toronto, for example, the competition is huge. We also have, as I, as I say, our biggest competitor now online is the cbc.ca. For newspapers, that's one of our greatest competitors. So we have a government sub, and they do it for free. And that's the competition. That's the world we now live in. It's not that anyone's valuing our content less because they still see it as being important, they still want, but they can get it for free. And that's what the generation wants. You know, it's, it's interesting, the iPad talked about, we had a little crack there, but the Star did, Torstar did do something called Star Touch. We had engagement of people for 30 minutes on weekend, 25 minutes, it was tremendous engagement, it just didn't catch on. It was, had to be based on an advertising model. We had amazing engagement and we, we, in terms of people being interested, but that was not a device, that was not something that was working. Readers today have chosen not to pay because they can get away with it, and they do. And there are so many competitors out there that are free, and so you can get your content for free. I think the critical argument here, and this is where I really do take exception to Andrew's point, is news a public good? Because the only way my argument makes any sense is if news, investigations, commentary, etc., is there a public good? Because if there is no public good in news, then we shouldn't be subsidizing. You can go back to the Greeks and their theory of democracy, and an essential precondition for a well-functioning democracy is that people be well informed so they can make intelligent decisions. If they're not well informed, the theory goes the democracy will not work as well. To me, you could not have a more fundamental 
public good than making sure the Canadian population is well informed, that the Canadian conversation is carried on in a way that allows people to make informed decisions. If you don't buy that, then, the, then I, I would accept there's no reason for helping newspapers. But newspapers are the one right today who are still providing most of that work. They're the ones with the reporters. They're the ones that are carrying on. Now, you know, um, I just want to say in terms of, I don't want the government, some government officials dec deciding who gets what. Those tax credits that have been on magazines and the rest, they're formula. How many reporters do you hire? Is your staff Canadian? Is the ownership Canadian? And if you meet the qualifications, you get the grant. There's no, it's been working this way for years and will continue to. Now, Andrew, you have been a firm believer for a long time that no public good is served and newspapers are going to survive. And I like to sort of end with uh, John Maynard Keynes, who made that famous statement, if the facts change, I can change my point of view. Can you? <laughs> Mr. Coyne, sir, the floor is yours for five minutes. Keynes also said we were the, all of us in the grip of long ago dead economists, so uh, <laughs> uh, one of his wiser sayings, I guess. Uh, I guess by way of rebuttal, I, I, I want to start by just noting how many of the arguments I made were not rebutted or even, really even addressed in my worthy, worthy colleague's remarks. Um, I went at some length talking about the failures of the industry from which a subsidy or a bailout would be essentially rescuing them. I didn't hear much defense of the industry's conduct and of the many and gross mistakes they have made. In fact, I heard one rather large mistake admitted to, which was we didn't pay, for, we didn't charge for anything. We gave it away for free. Now, I didn't hear, by the same token, I didn't hear much real investigation of the market failure argument. He thought of it after I'd raised it but didn't really address what exactly is preventing people from paying for our product other than the fact that we've been giving it away to them for free. Uh, there's not anything. In fact, when he wants to make that point, he says people actually do value what we, pro what we produce. They are actually paying for more. Well, if that's the case, well, let's just extend that a bit. If people are willing, if they value our product in the meaningful sense of being willing to pay the cost of its production, if they do value it so strongly, then he should be on my side of saying, let's charge them for it. Let's move to the reader pay model. Let's stop whining to the government, which will only get in the way of that transition. Uh, he should be on my side. The bulk of the argument, of course, was this argument that we, the media, are essential to a well-informed democracy. And while that sounds like motherhood, there's a bunch of assumptions kind of built into that. One is, that we ever were a well-informed democracy. Th this is, I would say, a rather rosy interpretation of the history of Canadian politics. Uh, um, you know, in a time when most of the country was illiterate, uh, that would not have been a big function. It would have, the newspapers would have been catering to a rather small sliver of the population. And even once literacy spread, it was again, as I mentioned, only a small proportion of the population that actually read them. And that portion was getting not necessarily well-informed by my brethren in the newspaper industry, but oftentimes ill-informed. It's like uh, um, Chesterton's thing about democracy. He said, democracy is government by the uneducated, whereas aristocracy is government by the badly educated. <laughs> uh, so th let's not be too rosy in our estimation of what exactly we were, uh, function we were performing. If you look at the average newspaper, most of its content is not these high-minded reports on committees. It's murders and rapes and it's bingo prizes and it's every other thing that we fill the paper with. We have a humbler role, I would say, in the grand order of things. But of course, the other assumption that's built into that is we're going to disappear. There's not going to be any more newspapers and therefore we're going to turn to fascism or something other than democracy. I heard you know, in, in the public policy reform report, there was a big part check stuck in there about fake news being an argument for government subsidy because Lord knows the strongest opponents of fake news are the government. <laughs> so
so there's a premise built in there that they're trying to slip past you, that if you care about democracy, give us a bunch of cash, because otherwise we're going to disappear. I think I've made the case that, in fact, there's no evidence that we're disappearing. We're going through a tough time, particularly legacy media, while at the same time all kinds of new startups are, are popping up and new business models are being figured out. I mean, if this was a year or two ago, I'd be more in the camp that said, oh my god, nothing seems to be working. But in fact, we are seeing evidence that quality journalism is the people are willing to pay for it and pay for it in large numbers. The, the, the Wall Street Journal just saw a story today. Now it has 2.2 million subscribers. Went up 30% in the last year after they stopped allowing Google to scalp it off and, and, and produce a sort of shortened version of it. So after they tightened the paywall, readership went up. That to me is a much more promising avenue for exploration. That's where our future lies. And rather than, as I say, whining to government, it seems to me it's time that we got busy on that future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coyne. Now, the floor is open to questions. There are two microphones. <clears throat> we'll have um, three questions and then have responses and then three more. So if you'd like to ask a question, you might want to come to the microphone. Uh, and it's one minute max per question, so the time slot is showing there. <laughs> okay. First question, right here, sir. Well, I'd like to start off by correcting a major misrepresentation that uh, Andrew Coyne made, which uh, John Honderich allowed to uh, slip by. And that is that Ezra is not uh, a, a, purveil a purveilor of hate, uh, hate and bile. Ezra is an exposer of hatred and bile. If you look at what Ezra says, he goes where other places won't dare. And imagine what he could do with the resources of the CBC. And I'm happy to say I contribute to Ezra, and I wish I could redirect such of my taxes as go to the CBC, to Ezra. And uh, a model to look for, by the way, is Jordan Peterson, uh, who's managed to make about half a million through his stuff, through his expose of, uh, pro, uh, expose of a new uh, set of so-called pronouns, which look like bad Dutch. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions? Uh, come on down. Hi. Um, so I, I guess the question I, I, I would have would, would be, uh, you said that the internet has made the newspaper industry more difficult, right? Um, in that sense, one would argue, to Andrew's point, there are many other uh, industries that have fallen by the wayside because of the internet. My question would be, you know, your definition of a pub, pub, public good is what's in the interest of Canadians, but at that same token, don't you think it's a slippery slope in the sense of you could define almost a number of different things as a public good, therefore they should be subsidized. Should we subsidize the taxi industry because people who can't drive rely on cabs, but we allowed Uber because Uber did business in, in a different way. There's two differences, I think, between leveling the playing field, i.e. adding HST, to Uber, so my question would be, what would your response be to how do you define a public good? Okay, and is there a third question? Sure, right here, sir. Um, <coughs> Mr. Coyne, um, I think you're taking a bit of an elitist uh, argument and putting forth the notion that uh, the newspapers <coughs> will survive. Um, I have no doubt that they will. The Wall Street Journal, as you pointed out, is 2.5 million subscribers. But what about people in Guelph, where they had a newspaper that lasted for 100 years that's now gone, or Nanaimo, another uh, small community? Um, how are they going to survive? Who's going to report, as, uh, as John said, uh, what's going on in their towns? And uh, it's not all rubbish, actually, I don't think. I used to work for a newspaper. We produced some very quali high quality uh, productions at uh, certain times. Uh, and. Uh, it's, it's uh, something I think that you're escaping or you're not looking at sort of the big picture of Canada. Small market uh, country, a uh, huge nation with uh, a second largest land mass in the world, and yet a very small population. So how do we deal with that? I was here when you uh, said that we didn't need to have the CBC, and uh, now we don't need to uh, subsidize newspapers. Uh, what's going to be left? <laughs> Okay. My God, the Harrison. Mm. Mr. Hondrick, the floor is yours for oh, I think uh, five minutes. I think response. that's right at Andrew. I think he. Uh, sorry, three minute response. <laughs> okay. uh, 
You, um, you respond to all three questions. I'll yes. respond to all three. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll thank you for that. Very. Uh, uh, you know, it's. I think, and I think the point that's made here is a very critical one. And I think the story in small town Canada is one that doesn't get a lot of publicity. When we think of, when we think of newspapers, we most often think about the big dailies. You know, I can, we have 125 community newspapers in southern Ontario. You should look at that map. In fact, the Pew Institute has done it in the United States and it's, Ryerson's done it in Canada. It's called News Deserts, a place where there is literally no one covering local news at all. Now this is not a place where Facebook, this is not a place where Google, Twitter, whatever. There is no local content. People don't know what's going on. Do we think that's important? The comment up here about the public good, it's a value judgment. There is no question. That's what we're up here deciding. Is news, is being informed something that we think is critical? I think the evidence is overwhelming. I think that's been part of democratic theory for a long time. I feel that is an absolutely fundamental tenet of how a good democracy works. Others can disagree. I think it is. I don't think it's the same as a taxi ride or getting a haircut or whatever. Sure, there are businesses that are going out of, out of business because of the internet and we're facing a lot of those problems. But we're talking here in my view about the democracy and people being informed and knowing what's going on. And, you know, Andrew can say, oh, well, you know, we're over. We don't know. If we don't know the basic facts, and by the way, some of that reporting, that basic nuts and bolts, the crime, the murders, the arrests, the school board, that's critical stuff. That's stuff everyone wants to know what's happening in their community. And if they can't get it, then where are they going to get it? That, to me, is the nub of the issue. Um, Mr. Coyne, the floor is yours. Uh, so the, to the first questioner, um, uh, we may not agree on the quality or otherwise of uh, Ezra's publication, but what you've made it clear is he represents a lot of people, uh, and he represents a point of view that exists in the country. And I repeat my point. If we are not going to subsidize him, but we're going to subsidize other things, then we're skewing the pitch. We're preferring one point of view to another. That is not the government's role. That is not the role. That's not how we conduct a free press in this country. So that is a conundrum and dilemma that I don't, th I don't think has been addressed uh, in the remarks tonight. Secondly, we said, well, you could make this case, uh, if, you, if you take too loose a definition of public good, you can make the case for any number of industries. Uh, and indeed, you, do, you could. And, and the feeling ap uh, appeals uh, for uh, the newspaper industry on the basis that it, we are all that stands between you and the loss of democracy I can recall many similar arguments made by many different industries about how they were special, they were unique, they were different, they were a special case. This wasn't just about saving our industry, this is about what it means to be Canadian. I've heard the oil industry make that argument, for example. Uh, people are adept at coming up with those things. There is a well-established definition of a public good in the literature. It's one in which, if there's any economists in the room, I think I've done a reasonable approximation of it. Uh, and it's not complicated. It's, it's, the, it's what I laid out is, is there something that prevents people from be actually being able to pay for something they want such that, people, such that people who don't pay for it can still get the benefit of that good? And when you have things like that, then you can't get people to pay because they know they can just free ride or not enough of them will pay. But that's not the case with news. It's not the case with newspapers. We can charge people for our product. The putative things that were put out about maybe there were these externalities, I don't think hold water. And certainly they're not of the kind of compelling case that would make the, the reason, that would make newspapers at the front of the line against all those other claimants making exactly analogous arguments on the basis of externalities and public goods. So you have to have a very strong case. I think I heard the word a very compelling case uh, before you can claim public good status. And we haven't heard that heard, made tonight. I don't think we've heard that made in general. Third, we heard that this was an elitist argument that Guelph has no news of reporting of any kind. Um, I just had a quick scan of my cell phone. Uh, the Guelph Mercury closed its print edition, but the Guelph Tribune is still publishing. And I would guess if you go online, you would find many different local uh, uh, discussion boards and news sites. Uh, Hyperlocal is one of the great growth areas in online news. What the larger point is, 
it's never been cheaper or easier to start up a publication. It used to be that you had enormous barriers to entry. You had to have printing presses, and you had to have people to distribute the paper to everybody's doorsteps. And you had to have large staffs of people, including, you know, in the days of hot type, you had to have all kinds of staff to do that, and the layout, and the, you know, it was enormous staffs to put out a newspaper. Part of the reason we have much smaller staffs today is, yes, we've gone through trying times, but also the technology has changed. We're in the middle of a very large transition process, I would be wary of making straight line extrapolations that say, because things are bad today, they're going to be bad permanently. Okay, more questions. So we'll have another round of three. Okay, there's one over this way. If you want to come to the microphone, sir, that would be the fastest way to do this. Okay. Um, two, three, okay. Number one here. Anyway. Sounds like it. Oh, hello, thank yep. you. Uh, thank you for the spirited debate tonight. I wanted to get your informed opinions on uh, talking about the future of the industry, things like the Government Accountability Institute in the United States. Uh, their model is they're privately funded by one of the, the secret of hedge funds. They're a quant fund called the Medallion Hedge Fund, and they have nefarious ties in the background. But at the same time, I'm confused uh, because <coughs> they they were... Uh, made the news for selling their stories to the Washington Post, the New York Times, and they seem to be hitting hard on both sides of the partisan aisle. Uh, so what do you think about models like that in the future of journalism? Thanks. Thank you. Second question here. Is it on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the topic of the debate tonight was about the government acting to save journalism. But we've spoken mostly about funding journalism directly through grants. Are there other ways that we could think about the government... Um, supporting journalism, like changing education, um, making a decent civics program, um, teaching English, emphasizing that over math and science. Okay, a third question. Uh, I very much enjoyed the debate tonight. It seems to me it boils down to whether newspapers are public good, and then John John makes a very convincing argument, or is it a product, in which case Andrew is, is right, the market will care of it, and, and if one provider dies, others lose, it takes a place. Question I have for you, Andrew, what if you're wrong? If actually it isn't a product, people know, does that mean it endangers our democracy, etc.? Okay. Mr. Hendrick, the floor um, is yours. The question, there's two questions here about uh, newspaper models, and uh, there are some very interesting new models being developed in the United States. Um, uh, for example, there are several, Politico is an, extra, is an excellent example of a website totally funded by foundations, excellent reporters doing superb work in which the financing is completely done by foundations. Not a bad idea. And if we could get that here, that would be an alternative. I can tell you we have an experiment going on at the Star now where we have offered foundations the possibility of they pay the salary and the benefits for a reporter who would cover an area that that particular person was interested in. Our first one, the Atkinson Foundation, uh, she's won many awards and she has a beat completely on precarious employment. I can tell you We've just got an offer from Unifor, the labor union, which in fact wants to have a good old-fashioned labor beat, and we're going to do that. So there are various models coming out there that in which people are trying to come up with different ways. In Boston, a very interesting case, the cultural groups in Boston were lacking coverage in the Boston Globe. The cultural groups all got together and they provided the funding and paid the salary of a cultural reporter. So, you know, and there are foundations, there's a lot more money to do this. There are a couple of foundations in Canada that have started expressing some interest. That might well be a different model in which some of this same kind of work can be done. We, we plan at this stage probably to have about 10 reporters. We've, we negotiated an agreement with our union where we can get 10 reporters where various interest groups, we had Tides Foundation, the environmental group as well coming forward. I, the idea of, I want to get away from the idea that it has to be the government doling out money, someone, these tax credits that have been around for film, for TV, for non-daily newspapers and magazines, 
How a tax credit works is there are simple criteria. How many reporters, owners of the, of the shares, where, there are about six or seven categories. And if you fit the category, then you get a certain amount of money. It's a formula. It's a bit like a meat chart. So you don't have to have bureaucrats or people in the prime minister's office sitting there and saying, I don't like this or I don't like Ezra. It's very simply, that's been in place before Confederation. Those non-daily newspapers and magazines, that's exactly how they've been getting assistance. And it's worked incredibly well. There hasn't been a controversy. So that can work. OK, I'll stop. <laughs> Coin, the floor uh, is yours, sir. First, on the, uh, the are there alternative models like, and I think the, what you were describing sounded like ProPublica, uh, sort of you know nonprofit public interest journalism. Um, yeah, they exist. I'm glad they do. I wouldn't want to depend on that in its entirety. Uh, I am a big believer that um, you that there's a certain vigor and vitality that comes from writing for a paying audience uh, and being mindful of the need to hold the audience's attention and not to waste their time. So all the high-mindedness in the world isn't a substitute for that if nobody actually reads what you've written. Uh, secondly, uh, there was the argument that we can provide uh, assistance in other ways, and the ones that were described I would be all in favor of. Yes, we should be teaching literacy, we should be teaching civic literacy in the schools, we should be encouraging young people to get in, in, interested in current events, all of those things. And there I will say that's both in our interest as a, as a uh, as a profession, but also in the interest of the country as a whole. Uh, but that's a very different thing than particular aid for the industry. Now, whether you call that a grant or whether you turn it into a tax credit uh, isn't as much of a difference as was being made out. The reason we have tax credits is that we don't have to call them grants. Uh, and <laughs> industry are very adept at coming up with complicated sounding schemes, you know, for accelerated capital allowances, et cetera. And when you look at them, they have no actual economic basis, and they're just a, a way of disguising what's going on. Uh, if the, the fact that there isn't Jacques Chrétien somewhere saying, oh, somebody's going to get that money and somebody else is going to, the fact that there's a list of categories and criteria right away starts winnowing out who gets it and who doesn't, and that's unavoidably political. You can't make the comparison to film tax credits or CanCon in pop. And by the way, there have been lots of controversies about tax credits in film. But you can't make the comparison that something is inherently contested as journalism, where everything is a fight, everything is contested. We heard, I, I said what I thought would be common uh, opinion in this room, that Ezra's website is detestable. We had somebody who passionately believes it's the only site that's telling us the truth. That's the nature <laughs> of journalism, it's the nature of politics. We wouldn't have governments deciding who could run for politics and who couldn't. That would be abhorrent to say, you, we're not going to allow certain parties to run. We shouldn't be making the same interventions in journalism. Final point that was asked is, well, what if I'm wrong? Well, I guess it depends what, you, what if I'm wrong about what. If I'm wrong about that I think uh, some of the, the legacy newspapers will actually survive and prosper, that their prediction of even their death is, is, is excessive, then I'm fully confident something else will take their place. Because I think the bedrock point is, there's a, an audience that wants to be well informed. It's not the whole of the population, but it's a significant chunk of it. And we just have to find a way to get them to pay for it. If I'm wrong about that, if I'm wrong that people would like to be well informed, if I'm wrong about the basic bedrock of, of my fellow citizens, well, then I don't know what we do. Because you can subsidize newspapers to write stuff, but you can't compel or subsidize people to read it. <laughs> OK. Are there any other questions? Let's see something here. Okay. Go ahead. You're the first one up. Okay. Hi. Thanks very much. Um, I'm really enjoying the debate. But my question is: Would uh, standardization or improvement of the profession of journalism having either a standard code of conduct or higher educational requirements, or have a specific journalist requirement, would that have any impact on for deciding which media should get funding or subsidies or tax credits? Uh, so that's my question: <laughs> If there'd be any difference if we standardize the uh, the industry at all? Thank you. Second question, sir. So I guess this is aimed more towards Mr. Hondrich. Um, I actually spend a fair bit of money every month on various online media. How can I give the Toronto Star money? 
it, it becomes a question that if you are not asking for it, how can I give it to you? <laughs> And why, when the three top stories, so hold on, why when the three top stories on the Toronto Star's website world, there's something about Donald Trump, fine, and then something about a United agent trying to wrestle a violin away from a musician, and I'm not joking, something about cats being relieved from whisker fatigue at dinner time. <laughs> so, if I can give you money, how and why? <laughs> And uh, our third question. Yeah, I don't really know how to follow that question. Um, so let's say I, I agree that there's a public good uh, in, in the media. And I agree that there's some formula that allows PMO folks not to be the ones to pick and choose who gets those subsidies. I guess my question is, what, what do we do when the money runs out? Or if the government only has a limited amount of money to spend to subsidize, then what would you suggest doesn't get paid for instead because it is a limited pot of money. That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Hondrick. Now, the I've got a three check minutes. I'm right here that I'm ready to <laughs> give to you to, if you want to donate to the Toronto. You're right. We don't ask, we don't ask for money right now. Stay tuned. We may start doing that in terms. By the way, we had a paywall. Didn't work. People, people weren't prepared to pay. Our audience went way, way down. We tried that. I can tell you the company that Andrew works for has paywalls at all its major newspapers. The experience has been exactly the same. Very few people are prepared to pay. That's been the issue. And until, on the issue of reporting, I gotta tell you, the people that we get today applying to be reporters are as well educated with as much background and much experience as I've ever seen. I don't think in any way the decline in the business is a function of poorer reporters and people not doing their job. I think the people we're getting now are just absolutely excellent. The issue is if you can get it free and get it somewhere else, that's exactly what happens. Public good. So Andrew says public good be should defined in terms of being able to pay for it. I don't think so. I think public good is a higher calling. It's something as a society, we have to be able to ask ourselves the question, what are those values? What are those ethoses? What are those facts that are so fundamental to who we are and what we're about and what our society is? What are they? It's a judgment, folks. It's a judgment. But I tell you, in terms of the news coming out and people being well informed, that to me is about as fundamental as it comes. Uh, Mr. Coyne. So just to pick up from that, we, there was a, a, bl a blizzard of different points being made there. On the one hand, the Stronger Star can't charge people because so few people are prepared to pay, which apparently is not the Star's fault, it's other people's fault for not being prepared to pay. On the other hand, Let's not talk about public good in any kind of meaningful sense, i.e., what's stopping people from paying other than the fact that the star puts up cat whisker fatigue stories on their website. <laughs> but let's talk about the higher calling every family, and the every fundamental values. Great. Let's yeah. talk about the higher calling and the fundamental values that should oblige people to pay when they won't pay willingly. Well, the problem with that is in a democracy, in a free society, it's kind of hard to say to people, Look, I know you don't think this is worth your money, as witnessed by the fact that you won't pay for it, but I'm telling you it is. So I'm taking your money. That's, that's the reason why economists have actually worked this out pretty carefully about what are the justifications for taking people's money and forcing them to pay for something in a democracy. I will say the suggestion that was made that there should be, whether you were making the suggestion or just raising the possibility of a code of conduct or occupational requirements, I think that's heading towards licensing of journalists. I am unalterably opposed to that idea. Some of the greatest journalists didn't even have a high school education. Uh, 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 Tom Stoppard, for example, started as a journalist. He, was, he, he traveled around a tramp steamer in his youth. I think Mencken was not particularly, uh, 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 I think he was an autodidact, if I'm not wrong. So there's, I, would, I think that's just, again, heading down even worse avenues. The last question was, what do we do when the money runs out? And the point was very well made, and repeating the point I made, which is, 
every time you're paying for something with government money, you're not paying for something else. You're denying some other thing which may well conform more to the kinds of things that government money should be used for than, let's say, bailing out newspapers. But even if you do that, it's either a transitional measure, which I think was alluded to at one point here. This is just to tide them over until we see where we're going with this, or it's not. But transitional measures have a, have a habit of becoming less than transitional. Because once you've given the money and once we've gotten hooked on it, are you going to be the government that's going to pull the plug in the Toronto Star? Are you going to be the, the government that sends the Globe and Mail to its doom? I don't think so. So let's not go down that road in the first place. Okay, so we are now at the uh, uh, concluding statements by our two debaters. Each will have five minutes. And I'm pleased to call on Mr. Hondrick again to uh, lead us into the final uh, two speeches. <laughs> so I want to go back. When looking at this whole discussion, we can talk about the economics of the business and people refusing to pay, et cetera, and the rest. I think people here know the troubles the industry's in and what's going on. I think of that 1834. The people in this country, when it was much less populated than it is now, decided that magazines and non-daily newspapers should be helped. And what was the reason? I want to say it again. To continue to provide Canadian readers with quality content. So prior to Confederate 1834, people who were making decisions, even back then, said this was something that was critical. Dare I say, a public good. That in fact, keeping the people of this country informed as to what was going on was absolutely critical to our well-being. For years and years, newspapers have thrived. Advertising, I used to be able to say, you can't advertise around the star. It worked well. We were able to pay for reporting. That was a great, we lit, went through a tremendous time. That time's no longer there. Models, other models may well emerge. They haven't yet. We are not in a state yet where we have alternate sources coming forward to provide that basic information. So we've had a system in place for well over almost 200, 200 years in which this, we have recognized that and we've been paying money. And by the way, I don't want to license journalists. The reason why you say you want journalists or you want people to be Canadian is because the government should only be helping Canadian jobs and Canadian publications. I don't want subsidies be going out to people not from this country. I don't think anyone does. And those criteria which are set down, and there will probably be some debates back and forth as to how one would apply, how one would make that work. And you have to probably get some outside people to come in. But we have a system that's already been in place. We've already done it for magazines and non-daily newspapers. I guess I'm saying you can use the same now for daily newspapers. The quote, to continue to provide Canadian readers with quality content. That was the argument back then. I don't think it's really changed. I wish that I wasn't standing here and having to say things have got to the point. But I tell you, make no mistake. Uh, I mean, people, the paying, the, the lines you're seeing in the newspaper revenues, I recommend the Shattered Mirror, which is the report that Ed Greenspan did on the state of the industry. That lays it out. Digital advertising in newspapers, that's one of the scariest charts and one of the parts most difficult, has been almost flat for the last five years. Newspapers aren't getting their share of the digital advertising. Who is? Google and Facebook. Now, by the way, there's some good questions there about whether or not we should act and you talk about government assistance, government action. Should we take action? At this stage of the game, Google and Facebook are taking all our con taking, taking it and putting it up for free. Should the, you know, and by the way, our copyright laws allow that. Should that be the case? We're paying for the content, we're paying for the reporters. 
They're using the content, putting it up line. Should we have changes in our donation law, which would allow us more ably to perhaps fund journalism in a different way in some of the models that have been raised and talked about here? There's another way government should help. Should government help the Canadian press? Should we allow them to get some help with their pension? The current time, it seems no. There are all kinds of ways in which newspapers can be aided in terms of what they're doing. But you have to decide for yourself whether you think what we do is a public good and if that's critical. I keep on coming back to that very base point. And it's a value. It's a judgment. It's the essence, I think, of what we're about, which is why I stand fully in favor of the emotion. Thank you very much. Mr. Coyne, sir, the floor is yours. Well, rather than beat your head over the head with arguments I've already made, I thought I'd just expand a bit on my, why I'm an optimist about the state of the industry and the future of the industry rather than a pessimist, as with John. Uh, one point that I'll make that he'll agree with, and he's made as well, is I think we've been relearning of late that there's no substitute for professional journalists doing the job they've been trained to do. It wasn't social media that broke the Mike Duffy, Nigel Rice story. It was a veteran working reporter. It wasn't Twitter that un uncovered all the many strands of the Rob Ford story. It was reporters working a beat. It wasn't bloggers risking their lives to get the story when a shooter was on the loose on Parliament Hill. It was the gallery. And in the States, you now have this brilliant reporting by the major newspapers on Donald Trump. Some things, that is, are constants. I remember an earlier epoch of revolutionary technological change during the first Gulf War, widely said to mark the arrival of CNN and all news television as a force. And like everyone else, I watched goggle-eyed for eight or 10 hours a day. And at the end of each day, I remember thinking, I can hardly wait to read the paper tomorrow so I can find out what happened. <laughs> Whatever else changes, certain things remain constants. One of these is time and the processing speed of the human brain. It takes time for us to fit events together into some sort of intelligible whole. The other is narrative. The de desire to have someone tell us a story is as old as human language. Sometimes we just want to leave the driving to someone else, tell us a story. That too is a constant. And yet the writer's maxim, do not waste the reader's time, has never been more urgent because the reader has never had more alternative ways to spend it than on your precious prose. As my old boss, Bill Thorsell at the Globe used to say, we're not in the business of selling you newspapers, we're in the business of buying your time. And if we're going to buy your time, we'd better make it worth your while. I've come to the view that much of what we value in a writer is what we value in a friend. Who do we like to hang out with? People who treat us with respect, people who interest us, people who can be serious, and also be not too serious, people who make us laugh without being flippant. But we're not likely to spend time with people who shout at us or lecture us or are always angry, and we certainly don't want to spend time with someone who talks to us as if they're doing us a favor, which is what I fear is the result of so-called public interest journalism. We need, rather, to make it a pleasure to read us. I say again, a pleasure, not a duty. But there's another sense in which reading is or ought to be a pleasure, I mean in a physical sense. I think we've underestimated its importance in all of what we're going through. Reading is, after all, a physical experience as much as an intellectual one. When we sit down to read, we look for a comfortable chair, we get a good reading light, get a cup of coffee. It's a physical experience. I think it's significant that people who were willing to pay to read the printed page have been reluctant to read our stuff online. I think a lot of it has to do with the physical experience. It's not pleasant to read on a computer, but it's a lot better on a tablet. Part of that's the form factor, the lean back versus lean forward thing, but a lot of it has to do with something else, instantaneous page loads. I'm just observing my own behavior but here, but I'm now a subscriber on my tablet to the National Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Daily Telegraph, and the Financial Times. Papers, except for the first one, that I never used to subscribe to because I didn't want stacks of papers cluttering up my house and I didn't want to squint at a computer screen. But here's what happens when I read them on my iPad. I start to browse through them the way you do a print newspaper or a magazine because I don't have to wait for the pages to load. And having spent that time with them, 45 minutes or an hour, I say to myself, you know what, I'm going to pay for that. I know tablets are out of fashion at the moment, 
But that's with the terrible tablets we have today. Imagine how much better they're going to be in three, four, five years or 10 years. And as they get bigger, thinner, lighter, with longer battery life and better displays, they'll be foldable before long. As they get more paper-like, they're going to acquire more and more of the virtues of the printed page. And I think we're going to find people are more willing to pay for that experience. So I think better technology is one part of that. But I think, obviously, the other key is writing better stuff. People will pay for the good stuff, the stuff they can't live without. They may not pay for the stuff they can take or leave, which is too much of what we've been providing them. But think what it will mean if we can pull it off, if we're no longer behold to advertisers but to our readers, if we're in the business of selling content to readers and not readers to advertisers. That may well be a golden age. Thank you very much. All right, we have now an opportunity for you to express your views on this motion once again. The uh, motion being the government must act to save journalism in Canada. All those who agree, would you please raise your hand? Okay. All those who disagree or oppose it. Um, and are there any unsure? <laughs> oh, a reasonable number, okay. Well, clearly the disagrees have it, uh, but I want to uh, first thank our debaters for their wonderful presentations tonight and congratulate them on that. Um, <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> and, uh, it's certainly been a most vigorous debate, and I think that's great. I also want to thank those who posed questions. Uh, I think it added to the tone of the debate and so on. And I want to thank all of you for coming and enjoying this and giving us your votes uh, on the motion to see how it was to go either way. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it, and I hope we'll see many of you next year, uh, well, this fall, when debates uh, are underway again. Thank you to the efforts of the McDonald laurier Institute. And I pass on my thanks to David, who I think is going to say some concluding words. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish all of you a very pleasant evening. Thank you. Well, th thank you. That was just terrific. I'll let you all go uh, almost right away. Just had a, a few words of thanks. Uh, and once again, I wanted to thank our debaters, John Honrick and Andrew Coyne, for just a fascinating uh, discussion. This is one of the best uh, debates I think we've had. Um, also, thank you to our moderator, Peter Milliken, uh, our media partners at CPAC, who have been uh, live casting the debate on their website and will broadcast, <clears throat> pardon me, broadcast it this weekend. Uh, the War Museum has been terrific. If you haven't seen the uh, Vimy uh, uh, exhibition, please do so. Uh, it'll be open for about an hour after we're done here, and uh, it's free to our guests tonight. Uh, thank you to our volunteers, William, Lee, and Leith, uh, to the MLI staff who are so vital to the success of the debate, uh, Juanita, Allison, uh, Jerry, Shamil, and Mark. Uh, we certainly hope to be back in the fall to bring you more great Canadian debates. Uh, thank you and have a good night.